morning and welcome to this week's edition of Tourism in Namibia, our live uh, broadcast, which we bring to you on a weekly basis on Saturday mornings. My name is uh, Frank Steffen. I'm the editor of Tourism in Namibia, uh, obviously our monthly edition of, of our Tourism uh, publication. Tourism, we're so used to saying Tourism, really tourism publication. Um, and it actually came to be, it was originally part of the Allgemeine Zeitung and that's how it became Tourismus in Namibia. So the name remained, but in the meantime, it's multilingual. So you're welcome. Uh, this Monday we'll have a new edition out. Uh, it will be inserted into some of the newspapers and it will also be available in, in shops around the country and, and tourist sites. But let's come back to the show. Um, we've got our normal run-up. We've got topics, we've got uh, destinations, and we've got an interesting interview or talk during To The Point. So first up is obviously topics, but before we do that, let's just have a quick look at the marketplace. <laughs> Topics, I've got quite a number this uh, week, uh, wanted to quickly uh, speak about them. The one thing that's quite close to my heart, um, I see in Vintook and all over the show, you see, you suddenly see these COVID masks uh, being discarded wherever people run around. And this I found quite an interesting post. It was done by Peter James Nugent. Uh, and, and he's got a point. He says, look at what happens simply because we don't care. Um, he actually suggested on his post on, on, on Facebook that one should simply cut through those, uh, um, those, those snares. Uh, but uh, the fact is we should simply make sure that they're in the dustbin. Um, so uh, really I would implore you to maybe just take care of those things. Make sure that they end up where they should and not around some bird or uh, possibly around the ankle of even a kudu. I mean, they just don't belong in nature. Second one was quite an interesting one. We brought that one in the Allgemeine Zeitung, um, and it was about elephants uh, who decided or they would like to visit Uis. Uis is an old mining town quite close to Brandberg. You can see the Brandberg there in the back. And uh, I, I find it quite heartening when when people always tell us, yeah, but, uh, you know, the human uh, and, and wildlife conflict, but then on the other hand, we see this and people still carry on. And I generally find that in Damra land, uh, people are uh, more than welcoming when it comes to elephants, because you've seen them, uh, uh, yeah, in recent past, you've seen them visiting, coming quite close to Korichas, which is really the capital of, of Damra land. So, yeah, interesting thing, just a bit of snippet news there. Then I would like to just remind you that this morning uh, you would have Otto Herigl Foundation. Um, they're asking people to clean the coast. Um, so um, this is obviously the, the main beach in Swakopmund uh, at the Mole, but um, uh, they've, they've got a number of places uh, they would like to clean the Khan and the Swakop River. Um, that's the Otto Herigl Foundation, and then the other one was Lindy Barnard, who asked people to come together and see whether they can't clean up mile 6 to mile 14, that stretch of coast. Right, and then finally, the thing that I thought was worthwhile just having a quick peek at, 
Um, most of the papers had it in uh, in their Friday editions. It's all about the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism who introduced his next five-year strategy. Um, it was quite interesting um, that he spoke specifically of elephant and uh, rhino uh, statistics where he, he proudly announced that um, you know, poaching is a problem. Uh, um, the, the police are getting better at it. Uh, MEFT is getting better at it, and they are all being supported by uh, the the local defence force uh, contingents up in the north. So in 2020, uh, we only lost 31 rhinos to poaching and 11 elephants. Um, this needs to be compared to figures of uh, 2015, it was still 15 rhinos and, and uh, 97 uh, rhinos and 49 elephants. Um, in, in 2016, the rhinos were still 66 and the elephants were 101. So really the numbers have come down. There's obviously always that uh, old conflict about how to manage them and what should be done and what shouldn't be done. Uh, where, where environmentalists would prefer that no rhino and no elephant would ever be hunted. Question is obviously, and we've spoken about it before on this show, um, when it becomes a real problem like you've seen in, in uh, Botswana, where the numbers have gone up to a level where you need to somehow find some form of control because at the end of the day, uh, you need to feed these animals. And uh, we've seen last year how many of them died of uh, uh, yeah, literally a shortage of food. And um, so whatever the, uh, the solution is, I'm not here today to defend either one. I just find the important part, um, and you could see it now with 170 uh, elephants being uh, taken out of Namibia. I just feel there needs to be consultation and an open discussion about it beforehand. Um, you will always have critics about each and every uh, solution you take or find. But at the end of the day, the important part is if you've spoken about it beforehand and you've been transparent in the whole process, then people tend to accept the answer, whatever the answer is. Anyway, that's the end of our topics for today. Next up, we've got destinations with Chloe Dewar joining me to introduce you to a couple of new holiday ideas. Welcome back. As you can see, Chloe has joined me. Chloe Deer, who obviously writes for Tourismus Namibia and uh, also takes care of our Twitter account and all those funnies. Instagram. I say Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you say that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. There must be some leftover from <laughs> Mr. Trump. <laughs> anyway, this is the part of the show that I actually always enjoy most simply because we introduce you to different destinations, obviously, holiday ideas. And who doesn't like doing that? Yeah, I mean. exactly. So what have you brought to us? Well, I, I just wanted to touch on Swakopmund a little bit because our holiday and action edition kind of revolved around Swakopmund, but we mm. never really spoke about the town itself. And um, there is something, I mean, I just, I fell in love with the buildings and I'm, uh, it's impossible not to really, yeah. but um, just going and taking the town by foot and literally just street by street, going past all of the buildings and really admiring the 
ancient architecture. I mean, I'm actually feeling that you're in Germany. It, it, <laughs> you really do feel that because yeah. even though some of the buildings or most of the buildings you're not able to enter into, the beauty yeah. of the exterior and the architecture is, is unlike anything that modern, art, uh, modern arch architecture can emulate. So it's, yeah. um, whether it's the old school buildings, the railway station, the yeah. lighthouse, there's just so much to this see. This is actually the Vermont House. Yes, yeah. yes, and each one of them has a has a different history of its own. Yeah. But um, but I'm I, I'm not sure if there is a map specifically. I'm sure there will be somewhere. But my best was just being able to like grab an ice cream and and just literally explore each and every um, one of the buildings. They are dispersed all over the town yeah. because the whole town itself is just almost decorated in these um, Germanic oh. buildings. But yeah. um, I, I, th I can't think of anything better than spending an afternoon just walking and photographing. But I would have loved to, I mean, I know the history afterwards, but while I was there, I would love to have had a little bit more insight into, um, and unfortunately the church was closed when, um, yeah, th when I was there, but apparently open. that's beautiful on the inside as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, but it just adds... reminds one a bit of the German church in, in, uh, in Lydritz. Oh, mm, okay. Yeah. If it's similar in the inside. Yeah. This, I mean, even, th even this was an yeah, absolutely this beautiful... Is the old station building oh is that what yeah, it is that's uh, in the back you had uh, the trains running in um, and then they changed sure. it over time because they didn't want that train noise in town all the time but i mean even just the colors yeah. i i can't believe how well the architecture has stood the test of time um, and what i like i must say uh, the swakop windows in that uh, respect are just a special bunch eh? um, they really look after their. i think in comparison to other towns that i visited th there is i mean you can see that they've been repainted and, and and renovated yeah. and looked There's after. There's a huge amount of pride in, in keeping heritage sort of going out. I, I, I must agree. I didn't realize that, but I definitely, and, and just everything about the town is so charming. And um, and so I, um, I can't recommend going there enough. I mean, obviously I can understand why it's such a huge holiday destination, but just uh, as a weekend getaway, I mean, there's yeah. so much to do and there experience. There is really, because uh, Swakopmund has over the years uh, uh, done lots of, uh, you know, this adrenaline uh, sort of junky stuff, you know, um, uh, sandboarding and parachuting. So and um, I know many of, of uh, many a person that uh, goes there and sort of does this um, where they take you on the back and then you paraglide uh, with, a, with a person who knows what, what they're oh, doing. I'm yeah, because, I mean, let's face it, uh, the average person uh, will possibly possibly do something like that. Yeah. Uh, because it's, uh, it's obviously a huge experience. Mm. Um, but who of us really has the opportunity to go and, and paraglide or... or, or uh, jump out of an uh, airplane that is functioning, by the way. So I'm not the typical uh, typical candidate for that, but but I like that this sort of thing is offered because well, people something are for there everyone. who love that. And, yeah. Uh, so whether it's parachuting, paragliding, sandboarding, uh, they've got these off-road uh, bikes and all that. So Restaurants. Really it's great I mean, it, there is something for everybody, yeah. and so. Um, while I tend to always gravitate towards wanting to understand the town from a historical or cultural perspective, there is something for the for adrenaline everybody. junkie, for the adventurer, and, and so it is a brilliant destination yeah. in and of itself. Totally agree. Um, and then I wanted to speak a little bit about um, Okakawara, which I, okay. is a town that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, in an upcoming edition, you'll read a little bit more about um, our Wartebach experience, but I spent a morning it, just immersing myself in the town and learning more about the Herrera culture. But there, there isn't a, a town that I've visited in Namibia yet that is so um, prou proud of their culture. Yeah. And this was on a day where all cultural museums were closed, you know, um, mid lockdown. And so nothing, everything that was happening was so authentic and real, which is what I absolutely loved so much about it. Um, each and every one of the people were so passionate about uh, telling me about their dress and teaching me how yeah. how they um, tie up their hairdresses the perfume that they use you can see in these beautiful bottles that all lines the streets you know mm. um a, a traditional food stands and this is on a day where there were absolutely no tourists that were coming in and out and this is yeah. just and that's what i absolutely loved about it um and so b because more often than not i feel 
that sometimes it's, it's put on rather than being a kind of real authentic experience. Yeah. And for me, it was one of the most memorable experiences because I got to taste all the different roots that they use and they were just eager to teach to me. Teach you, yeah. And I, I really love that because I mean, and asking nothing in return other than just teaching me this. You'll read about it in our story, but that's the lady Miriam who um, I ended up dropping off um, at a funeral later on. But we got on like a house on fire and yeah. there wasn't space in the vehicle. So I just jumped into the back there to be able to take her. But learning about like, the, you know, questions that you couldn't just ask anybody off the street um about the number of petticoats they wear and the you know the perfumes the and really, just yeah. really just learning about tradition outside of this uh this like historical books or internet mm. it's great and i, but, I think but i must say the overhead radio the traditional authority they they um they're supported well by their people uh okakarara i remember the first time i I drove through there, it must have been like 25 years ago or something, and uh, what I remembered was it was a quaint little, little, it was really a little town, and what, what always sort of stuck in my brain in those years was um, there was a woman um, busy cleaning her yard with a broom. You know, obviously lots of the ground at, at Okakarara is very... Uh, um, Fertile. No, no, uh, what you call that red? Uh, clay Calahari, soil. yeah. And so it gets very hard. So you could literally uh, take a broom and actually clean it up. And that sort of stuck to my mind always. And, and then if you compare that to today's Okakarara, it's actually beca becoming a very modern little town um, uh, where, where they're doing a huge amount of effort to, to develop it and stimulate trade and so on. Um, because many Herero are at home in that area. Is that the Herero capital or is it difficult? You can't really say it's a capital. It's, it's one of their main centers. It's, it's, it's regarded possibly as a sort of unofficial uh, capital because Ochimbingo is also important. Mm. Um, uh, Opuvo is very important. So uh, those are different sites and obviously d uh, um, different uh, clans of the tribe mm -hmm. live uh, live in various areas, you know, that's the way it is, but it must certainly be regarded as one of the main uh, sort of centers for them. Because remember, for the Herrera, the important center is really Okahantia. Yeah. That's where they've got their traditional burial sites for for all the uh, uh, big chiefs and so on. But yes, Okakarara should not be underestimated, obviously close to Hamakari and, and you know, Waterberg were mm. obviously those huge battles took place so it's an interesting place and I've been there often since then so and I've always sort of felt welcome and there's no animosity even if I'm German speaking there's no, no not at all yeah, yeah. I, I was very I I could go back there tomorrow I wish I'd spent more time there um, and it would be great to have visited one or two of the living museums but they were all closed yeah. but I mean that unfortunately they're a bit dilapidated uh, really yeah um, because they're not properly used um, uh, one of the, the, the one right in the entrance of town is actually quite a nice one and um, it sometimes saddens me to see that it's sort of gone down the drain a bit um, because it started off so well but I think the biggest problem is that up to now the town lay off the sort of tracks that mm. lead past because it's still quite a, a way back in even if you if you close uh, uh, you know having stayed at Waterberg where I see these little towns uh, getting some mileage is in future with this new tar road leading from yeah. Kobalvis up to Grootfontein that obviously shortens the drive for many a person that wants to go north and even if you just go to central north yeah. then you would technically come past Okakarara exactly. as you go towards Osh uh, Ochivarongo. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a special, it's it's a special a, yeah, place. No, I think they'll pick up. And then, like I said, the area are quite crafty in, in finding Proud ideas on well. how to, yeah, no, no, crafty in this case in stimulating growth mm. and then getting new business ideas going. But also, I, they're so proud of their culture. You almost don't need the living museums because it's, you it's know, are, it's yeah. it's just they they embody it in mm. in their daily life so much more than many of the other cultures in Namibia, um, which tend to be getting lost. There's a the, the, for some no, no, other reason. No, no, that one won't get lost. Don't you worry. Yeah. No, no, yeah. And then um, just s something that I absolutely reveled in. I'd always heard about the lakes in Namibia and the aquifers and the mm. sinkholes, but I um I actually just kind of 
snuck out of the Ochizondupa region just quickly just to have a look at what was going on there. Yeah. Um, and this is the old steam pump lake, otherwise known as Oshikoto Lake. Um, yeah. And it's it's fascinating. I mean, it's so close to the main road. It's so worth stopping over. Well, um, it's directly next to yeah, the it's main road. Hundred meters, yeah, hundred meters, literally. Much, yeah. But it it really is it really is amazing. I mean, in World War One, you know, all the German troops threw their weapons into the but lake. It's not all. What happened is a, a, a quite a strong contingent was still up there because remember. Um, the, the World War uh, uh, ended very soon for, 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 for Namibia in those years, or German Southwest Africa, because it was uh, already in July uh, 1915, it was done and dusted, because that's when the South African forces had come up to, to, to the height of Korab, which is like just outside of Tavi. And obviously, because they didn't want to give up all their weaponry, oh, they had literally they chucked they it chucked. in there. A lot of it is in the Tumeb Museum. Yeah. Um, but experienced underwater divers can go and look at the underwater museum which you know is apparently an incredible experience but i mean yeah. i've never i've never been a it diver it is actually you had a couple of guys who actually did that years ago and uh, to illustrate the the um, the the depth of the of the oshikoto lake uh, they literally uh, put a diagram of the um, the the german church here in Windhoek uh -huh. and put next to it just to illustrate the depth and sure. the luck and, and, and that was the known depth because they, they really they can't go as far it, down yeah. as they would like. And there speaks, uh, th this is um, the second, the... Greener uh, Sea. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a bit, this one you can swim at. And so yeah. I, I have to say that you can't swim at Oshikoto Lake, but there is just something so magical. I mean, these water, this is the color of the water. Yeah. This isn't photoshopped or anything like that. And it's... Uh, the, it's um, some people say that they're linked, um, but uh, it's been proven that they aren't, or it's still no, being no, worked out. At one stage, people were speculating about whether they sort of have an open channel and are, are interlinked, and that is not so. They are yeah. interlinked simply because it's the cast felt. The yeah, cast yeah. felt is very uh, permeable, and it's funny enough the the cast felt actually goes uh, like quite close to Ochivarongo, but not right up to Ochivarongo, uh -huh. but it still includes Ucho. Oh, which is okay. like further out to the to the west obviously but the cost felt is huge and it obviously goes up to Grootfontein and an immensely water rich area sure i mean you so can so are they interconnected yes but simply because of the water table that interconnects the whole cost felt but it's, it really is unbelievable and whether it's on your way to it um, Itasha or coming home from Itasha, it really, I, I cannot recommend enough swimming in that water. It is warm. You wouldn't even believe how warm it yeah. is. And um, it's it's just like an experience not to be missed. I'd seen photographs previously and thought that the water could not be that blue. But you literally swim with tilapia nibbling at your toes. Uh -huh. It's it's an unbelievable addition to any trip, yeah. I think. The Guinness Sea is obviously a bit off the track. Yeah, but, but you can also make kilometers. it interesting by simply going that route out, going through to the greenness and then sort of joining up to Otavi instead of going back to, to Exactly. Zuma. But I mean, it's not far off the track no, at all. But, but I mean, most people sort of feel now I'll stick to the main road and that's what I do. Do and it. And so they miss yeah. out on that. No, don't miss out. It's, it's so worth it. One day I'm going to go and explore Dragon's Breath. That is, that's on yeah, my Yeah, yeah, that list. one we need to do. I was trying for us to do that, but it's obviously on the private farm. So exactly. No we'll, we'll find a way. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. But maybe they listen to this program and say, okay, if they want to write about it, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, talking of that, um, we would much welcome you guys to, to send in videos, uh, share them on, on uh, Instagram. I almost said Twitter again. <laughs> yeah, uh, share them on Instagram, follow us, uh, even share them with us so that we can post them on, on, on Facebook. Um, we want to tell you stories and... Uh, yeah, would really want people to know what you do. So please uh, don't shy away. Even if you only send us photos, that's fine too. We'll make a bit of a slideshow and post it on our on our Facebook site, Tourism in Namibia. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this part. Yep. So I'll see you next week on this okay. on this show. Thank you.
Right, that was Chloe. Obviously, she joined me in the studio. As you can see, our background today it's, uh, are these uh, Santov uh, lilies, which come out uh, during the rain. We just thought that uh, we wanted to share that picture with you. And uh, yeah, obviously, she's shown you that Swakop has more to offer than just action and 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 the beach. Um, so go there, have a good holiday, or. Just do what you do. But um, as you can see, she's got different ideas where one can go. Who would have thought that Okakarara is a holiday idea? But it really ties up with the previous uh, um, story that I brought where I said people don't go to Ovamboland. Why not? There's a, quite, a, there are quite a number of sites and, and places where it's worthwhile going. So if you go to Kaokoland, you might as well go through Ovamboland and sort of join that thing. Or if you go to Kavangoland, you might uh, add a bit of Etosha and go through Ovamboland, go up to Okongo and then over to Nkurunkuru, Rundu and those sites. So don't always take the normal route. Think out of the box, there, there are many sites. And Okakarara is the same thing. Why always take the main road up to, to Bushmanland? You might as well go via Okakarara, see those backwaters go through Omaheke and make your way up to, uh, uh, you know, those uh, Tsumkwe and, and other sites in Bushmanland. So don't always stick to the same sort of routine. That's my advice to you. Up next, we've got to the point and uh, yeah, I, I just felt the need after a presentation earlier in the week by Recon Africa that we should just maybe talk about it a bit more. And I invited Rob Parker, who's a Canadian citizen, to, to, to talk to me about it, seeing that um, yeah, well, the company who's doing this uh, uh, mining or the, the explore, the, the search for oil up there is a Canadian business. But let's see. Welcome back. As you can see, I'm not alone in the studio any longer. Rob Parker, yes, welcome. Thank you very much. So I invited uh, Rob for the simple reason that uh, we've obviously been uh, all speaking about uh, Recon Africa and this new endeavor of theirs up in Kavangoland, uh, where they would like to explore uh, or actually uh, really extract oil and gas and whatever. And uh, the, the biggest fear really is not only that, uh, that oil rigs will be brought up there and the, the, the actual exploration process, but the way in, it, in which it is done and, and the manner in which uh, they apply their, their safety rules and their, their quality checks and so on. So we'll be speaking about that a bit, but first of all, in the beginning of the week, we had Recon Africa for the first time sort of facing uh, the public down in Vintuk. Up to now, they've had limited uh, uh, amounts of public meetings up in the north. And uh, most people were not too impressed with, with the results, especially the manner in which they did their thing there. So coming to the point, Rob, what was your impression of that, of that presentation up at Tule uh, early on Monday? The, thank you, Frank. That was a, you know, I, I and a lot of uh, people waited with, with great anticipation to, to kind of see how Recon would be dealing with the public, the manner in which they'd be dealing, and kind of how open and transparent they were, they were going to be, you know, given the previous cons c criticisms yeah. that, that, you know, there's been insufficient public consultation. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I did watch with great interest and, and I, was, I was somewhat disappointed by, you know, the tone that, that kind of came out straight from the beginning, yeah. you know, it was very hostile, you know, and it didn't seem to me like, you know, like these people were having a good time, like they, they wanted to be there. Yeah. You know, you kind of got that vibe. There was a lot of, a lot of this. Very aggressive. Um, yeah. um, I, I remember getting up at, uh, right in the beginning because um, Claire Priest, who was the one who led this whole thing, and, and she presented it to, uh, together with Dr. Sindila Mwiga. And um, so, so clearly they, they had their intention and wanted to sort of state their case. But I mean, um, I literally got up, I remember uh, telling her, listen, this is not the way that you talk to us. I mean, we, we're all, all adults and we, we want to hear what you have to say, but not in this manner, because she was giving us a lesson about racism and stuff like that. It, it, it was a bit rich, you know, yeah. uh, co coming, coming probably from, from, from the, the soil company, you know. Um, what what I what I noticed, you know, is is you know they're not there to kind of have a consultation. You know, they're there to, you know, they have a um, some some talking points that mm -hmm. they really want to get out there, 
and they're really trying hard to control the narrative. Yeah, so exactly. I, I feel like the, the public consultations are kind of a, a big inconvenience for them, mm. right? And, and you know, if you kind of look at their, their public relations and the way they've been doing things, you know, uh, you, you start to notice some very unusual things, yeah. right? This isn't, this isn't the normal working of, a, of, of an oil and gas company. You know, and, and, and that's really what I, what I felt when I saw. Uh, remember, you know, when, when, when as a child you were accused of something and, and you knew you were wrong, uh, you automatically come out aggressively. In, 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 you know, in German they, they've got the saying that uh, if you want to defend yourself, being aggressive and proactive is the best way of doing it, mm -hmm. especially when you know you, you don't have a point to make. And, and, and this is how, how, how that, the, that whole system was to me, that whole talk uh, came over to me. And, and, and what really came out of this whole presentation was that um, exactly what we'd feared, and we, we had fortunate for us, we had a couple of real geologists there who knew this stuff, and uh, they quickly pointed out that normally you, do, you first do a seismic test, and then you decide where to, to, to put your, your oil rig and start uh, doing uh, some, some uh, exploration, um, you know, by actually testing the ground and so on. And um, so what, what struck me was uh, that, that uh, Claire Priest was the only one who found that strange. And uh, Dr. Nguia was really non-committal on mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but but, but uh, clearly there were three geologists and they were all on the same page on, the, on, on this one. You first do the, your seismic uh, measurements and tests and, and then you start drilling a hole into the ground. So that already showed to me that I think what happened in November was that um, they suddenly had to sort of uh, put down facts. Mm -hmm. And that's, they, they couldn't get that rig here fast enough, you know, just yeah. to start, just yeah. to make sure we're on the ground, nobody can tell us not to come anymore. Right. And that's why they did it the wrong way around, as far as I'm concerned. Right, and, and, and you know, having that kind of um, assessment done, done piecemeal, yeah. you know, makes it, makes it harder to challenge, makes, you know, there's, there's less of the consultation than there should be. You know, if you, if you start to, you know, have a look online at the way the company is behaving, right? You start to see a lot of ads and a lot of paid ads and a lot of kind of very unusual activity, right? I've never yeah. really seen uh, an oil company pay for, pay for ads before and I've had a few investors kind of say the same thing, yeah. you know, and, and they've been, you know, censured already by the Toronto Stock Exchange. You know, so there, as you said, there's a real kind of sense of urgency yeah. on their part to, to kind of plow forward, yeah. right? And get, move that process forward. And, and I think you saw that kind of sense of urgency in, in that interaction, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the community, right? Whereas it's, you know, we're here to do this, and make peace with it <laughs> and deal with it essentially yeah, yeah. right and and th this is really my biggest issue and, and i think it's probably an issue which is shared by many um uh, people tend to think Ach, it's up in kavango it's far away it's not that far away like i showed you earlier on that hydrological map uh, or actually on google maps mm -hmm. i showed you uh, the problem is that you've got this uh, kavango epokira basin mm -hmm. which literally reaches up to and actually even beyond Rundu, coming right down to Grootfontein, Ochivarongo and Khobabes. And I, I cannot stop stressing that uh, uh, issue. It's one big interlinked basin. And, and the problem is, uh, uh, we spoke about it earlier as well. If you think three, four years back, we had in, in, in Novumberland, we found that huge aquifer. And, and, mm -hmm. and certainly everybody suddenly thought, oh, finally our water problems are over until the voices of reason came in and said, yes, the water is there and it's probably going to be uh, some of the best water ever in Namibia. Yeah. But the problem is if you drill now, because you've got all these various alluvial uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, not shifts, um, layers, um, and, and what happens is if you drill through that, the sal saline solution, which is so typical of Itasha Pan, for example, might quite easily get into that water. So in, in, in when, when you've got a drilling uh, operation in that area, you really need to be 
safe and you need to make sure that you've got the proper cases so and you go forward with the right technology. So, I mean, given, given that's the situation, you know, um, and, and kind of looking at, at what the work recon's done so far, you can see clearly that they're, that they're skipping steps, right? That yeah. they're not, you know, they didn't line their, their drill mud pit. This is, yeah. you know, kind of uh, basic I industry standards, international standards. I, I know that those are Canadian standards and this For is sure. a Canadian company, yeah. right? Um, so the fact that they feel like that they don't have to live up to that and nobody's going to really scrutinize them. Yeah. You know, uh, how do you build that boats for, for the water supply that you just talked about? Yeah, well, that's a, that's the, that's a big thing. You know, um, if, 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 if they drill in right down to 300 meters and they've been saying so far, mm -hmm. nobody knows whether it's true. Maybe they've gone further because right. they haven't been truthful about whatever they've been doing so far. Right. So if that saline solution runs down, let's say they don't have the casings in place that they should, yeah. okay, or they, they allow water to get through to the bottom or whatever, um, then already we will have uh, polluted water further down. Are, 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 you problem are, you talking about, are you talking about Windhoek's water, Frank? Not really Windhoek's water per se. I'm mm -hmm. talking of the whole of Omaheke, right. um, the la a large part of Ochidonjupa. Because right. that, that's all groundwater interconnected. Right. Okay. And, and, and uh, um, as long as you don't have new water running through to actually uh, um, sort of fill up those, those, those under, underground basins again, mm -hmm it will trickle towards a center somewhere. Right. And so th that's just the way water does it. Right. And, and uh, if there's polluted water on that side, it will start trickling into this water as well. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the, the basin, the Okavango Epukira Basin actually gets very close to the cast area. Right. And cast area is water that essentially can land up in Vintuk for the simple reason that they actually use the Omataku Canal Right. to bring water from, from that area. Right. The, the problem is that I'm not a specialist, so I mm. can't really decide is it what it is now, mm. but neither are they. Right. And that's part of why they need to get the specialists in. What, and what I don't see that happening right now. You know, when, you know if, you, if, you, if you look at the environmental uh, impact assessment, you know, one of the, one of the you know, crucial criticisms is that, is that this thing is missing you know, um, declaring where the water is going to come from, how much yeah. water is going to be used for the well, you know, and, and you know, it looks like that part was kind of deliberately, le you know, deliberately left blank on the, on the test paper. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's because it's, it's, it's inconvenient for, for Recon to deal with that. Yeah, and it's actually huge amounts of water. Now, we must always remember um, yeah. there was this idea years ago to actually um, literally pump water out of the, the um, Kavanga River. Uh, down towards the Omataku Canal and then take it to Vintuk because, I mean, that's the way you can sort of make sure that in the next drought Vintuk would be safe. Yeah. And uh, part of the reason why they're not allowed to do it is because internationally there's a law that says the last user of water is still entitled to receive X amount of water. So if you're one of the countries uh, through which uh, a river runs, you cannot solely make use of that water. Right. Typically, the Kavango uh, starts up in Angola. They cannot allow, uh, uh, alone decide to what, sh uh, what extent they'll use that water. Right. They need to make sure that enough water runs through to Namibia, even though it's only that short stretch where the Kavango actually goes through. Yeah. But it, it, it ends up in the Kavango Delta. Right. So Botswana also has a say in this. And that's why you've got these various committees that actually look at the water flow right. and make sure that this thing is handled the right way. So to me, it is just almost inconceivable how our ministries of, of environment and, and for that matter, agriculture and mm -hmm. also mines and energy in this case, have not said, well, guys, let's first find out what mm -hmm. will the impact be on this environment. I mean, I see UNESCO could basically convince them now to stop it to deal with us. At least that area is safe. Mm -hmm. But like I showed you earlier on the map, from, from Kaute over to Bushman land, yeah. it's a mere 70 k's as the crow flies. That's just around the corner. And to, to now tell me, but it won't have an impact. No, it might not have the direct impact right now with a single uh, 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 rig doing its right. thing, possibly not even on three. Yeah. But we know that they compared to the Texas Perm Basin, yeah. 
yeah. you know, the Midland Basin, and they say it's the exact same as you would have in the Kavango. And, and so fracking is the future there. It's the only way they can extract oil if there is oil. Well, I mean, you know, that, that's the other kind of worrying thing is, is that there's a huge discrepancy between yeah. the things that they tell their investors for the purpose of their, raising you know, money. Uh, for the purpose of raising money and, and um, you know, bumping up their, their stock price and, and the difference between what they tell the Namibian public. Yeah, to, right. uh, because in, in this case, they told us no fracking. No, no, no fracking, right? But, but uh, you know, in, in their investor presentations for, for 11 straight months, right? So that's not a typo, right? Uh, from, from, from May 2019 until March 2020, uh, on, on their investment plans, they said uh, modern frack stimulations, yeah. you know, i.e. I fracking. So, you know, it, it's, it's disconcerting that, you know, they've told investors, fracking and, and the possibility of hundreds of wells. Yeah. And, and they're painting a different story, you know, for, for the public and maybe they're painting a different story uh, at their meetings, yeah. you know. And I thought it was quite telling, you know, when, when confronted directly and, and you know, um, by, by some of the geologists in the room who said, you know, you were originally sold this as, a, as, a, as, as, as a an unconventional operation. play, yeah. right? Um, with, a, with a possible upside in, in conventional. And, and now you've completely changed your mind. And, and how did that happen? And at the end of the day, you know, Claire Priest and, and, you know, they couldn't come out and say, we're not going to be fracking. Yeah. All, they, all they can do, and if you look at their press statements, they say, this is not the stage where fracking happens. You know, hashtag yeah. no fracking. You know, yeah. as, as if that was the question, you know, what stage are you at? Exactly. The question is, do you intend to frack? And, and they've that been I quite clear. Also specifically, I said, can you categorically say that yeah. you won't That's be right. fracking? Yeah. And then she came with this nonsense answer about uh, she, she's not here in 60 years <laughs> to actually tell us. Yeah. Well, they've told uh, everybody and the investors specifically that mm -hmm. there's enough oil for the next 25 years. So um, if, if no fracking is intended in those 25 years, then she should have told me, but mm -hmm. she can't because that she knows that's the natural progression of how they would go for the next step. That, that you know, that's, that's kind of the, the worrying part. You know, if you, had, if you had a company that just came in and said, look, this is, this is our honest situation and, and these are our honest goals, and then you could evaluate it on, on its merits. Exactly. You know, but this is constantly shifting truth um, and, you know, they're, to an extent, they're, they're hiding behind the government mm. because, and hiding behind their permits, you know. And, and it's actually quite funny how they, in some of their presentations, they are uh, very adamant that this is a, is a, a deal done and dusted simply because, um, uh, as they put it, uh, the Namibian government is the owner of the land. I've got news for them. That land is communal land. Mm -hmm. And you try and get the government to suddenly decide to take away uh, land as they would like everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it would be a really a tough government that takes that sort of decision and, and faces up to the next election. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the government has, uh, has a bit to, to, to consider here, more than just the obvious. And, you know, you're talking in terms of water supply up in the north. You're talking in terms of uh, these guys have literally put their rig next to the Mahungu Feld, mm -hmm. um, not caring a damn about what's going on there. Yeah. And uh, so this is the sort of thing, and, and it, this thing will have long-term political uh, repercussions if the government is not aware of it. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'd maybe like you to speak to possibly come some of the fallout in, in possible bilateral relations between Namibia and Botswana, you know, when, yeah. you know, when, when this kind of thing floats down. It's Especially with Kaza being there. Right. I mean, you've got the Kavanga Zambezi Transfrontier Park, and it's, it's not only Namibia or Botswana, it's even Angola, it is Zambia, it is Zimbabwe. Everybody is in that big, huge park where we've decided uh, we'll, we'll look after our elephants and our buffalo and whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to suddenly come and say, but this is not the ecologically uh, sensitive area, so don't worry too much about it. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's nonsense. And, and other. By the way, that uh, I think we've said what we wanted <laughs> to say, um, but I still wanted to just mention, uh, Rob is not your typical environmentalist. I mean, that's not what you do. Yeah. It's, it's just a case of you saw something that's not right. And that's why I actually wanted to invite you. It's a Canadian. 
Um, so uh, he has a good idea of what to expect in terms of standards and uh, I would say uh, how Canadian companies behave overseas. Well, I mean, you know, to, to me, to, to look at, the, you know, the kind of actions of this company and then to try and square it with the, the agenda of the, of the Trudeau government, you know, um, their, their, their recent bills in terms of, you know, net zero emissions. Yeah. And then you, you turn around and you allow this uh, oil company to, to actually export your, your dirty technologies. Yeah. And, and bring them somewhere else. And, and the question is, you know, is, is this being counted in your net zero emissions? What, what, your, what your company does and, and you know, that you're, that you're responsible for? So for me, you know, I'm not an environmentalist. Uh, you know, I've been in Namibia for, mm. for uh, a dozen years or so. You've never seen me uh, on the television mm, talking yeah. about uh, the environment or anything like that. I'm usually talking about pyramid schemes. Yeah. But, but the reality is this situation is so egregious this company is so greedy that um, they're failing to live up to basic um, industry standards. They're, in my opinion, not being honest with Namibian people, right? Mm. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest the, the, This is a Canadian company, and as a Canadian, I feel like I have a certain responsibility to say, don't trust those guys over there, yeah. right? Um, because they, they really haven't shown themselves to be trustworthy. And if you look at kind of the history, you know, 60% I think uh, of the world's mining companies are based in Canada, mm. right? So Canadian um, companies have been accused previously of, of acting with impunity abroad, right? Mm. Mm. And, and the good kind of news is some of them have been actually held to account through litigation in, in Canadian courts, mm. right? Uh, Nevsambi Araya was, was uh, in Eritrea, that. right? Mm. Um, and, and some of those Eritreans went to Canada and they sued, uh, they sued that Canadian company and they, and they won. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I hope that, that recon investors are aware, you know, that there are methods of, of holding this company accountable, even if they don't happen here. Yeah. And I think that's the most important message today that uh, you can't tell one thing to an investor and tell people who are, who, who indirectly foot the bull at the end of the day, something different. Uh, those two stories need to gel so that both of them have an exact idea of what they're letting themselves in for. And we currently feel that's not the case in the... This, this company hasn't paid a bond, right? So, and, and they've incorporated a, you know, a subsidiary, yeah. right? And what happens when the oil runs out or the money stops flowing exactly. is a little subsidiary declares bankruptcy and gone there. Right? And they're gone. There's nobody you can hold responsible. They haven't paid a bond for cleanup, meaning the cleanup is on the Namibian taxpayer. Mm. In Canada, Justin Trudeau just, just signed something that cleans up after Canadian oil companies mm. who, who don't clean up after themselves. Um, 1.7 billion Canadian to, to go around capping wells. So this, yeah. is, this is, you know, what we see is, is that the private sector in the extractive industry has to be compelled to act right. You need a strong state to say, we're going to hold you accountable. If you don't right? follow the rules. Right? If you don't follow the rules. And Namibia doesn't seem to be doing that right now, and it's tremendously worrying. But they in a, they in a, in a, they've got a conflict in, of interest themselves because they, they've got a 10% share in that company. Also. And that's where the dirty work starts coming into. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they're so totally convinced that the government will stand by them. But I've, I've got news for them. Uh, a government at the end of the day is accountable to the people. So mm -hmm. let's see where that goes. You know, uh, uh, just kind of one, one last point on, on yeah. that 10%. You know, if you're, if you're familiar with the Companies Act at all in, in Namibia, right? 10% is not a number that gets you at the table. No, right? it's to not a minority share. You well, well, it is a minority share, but not with voting rights. That's right. Mm. You, you've got no say. That, yeah. that, that, that oil company, once they get that, they're going to, you can see already, you can see in their eyes, they're they going to do what that. they do. You're gonna true, they're going to view that as, as carte blanche to do uh, in this country, which, which, you know, five years ago, most of those guys couldn't have found on a map, right? Yeah. Um, they're going to do what they please. Yeah. Yeah, and with that, we come to the end of this talk. Um, I literally invited Rob simply to have a different view to only mine, um, even though it's very uh, you know, parallel-minded almost. Um, 
But I think all of us need to think well about this, thi uh, this story. Um, this is not only some faraway place up northeast of Namibia. It really is Namibia. And uh, contrary to what Claire Priest reckoned, uh, it's, it's part of us. It's not only the Kavangas who decide. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. See you. Right, and that's the end of our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, not only good news, but hey, that's part of life. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I must admit, I'm a very committed uh, uh, follower of what happens up in, in Kavango, uh, especially because I feel it's, it's a business that will be around for 25 years. We've spent 30 years to build Kavango into the tourism destination that it has become. Yes, sure, it's not always easy. Not everybody has been looked after yet and we need to find those solutions. But by going now and simply allowing one company to destroy whatever we've got up there, and it really is a heritage area, to go and destroy it and then end up after 25 years when they're rich and out of the country again, then we start building another 30 years on tourism again, if at all possible, because by then fracking would have likely destroyed every bit that is up there. So I don't know. I, I, I feel in this day and age where we, where we need to aim at cleaner uh, solutions to our energy problem, this is not a, not a good idea, not for a small country like Namibia, because we're the dot on the map of, of the world and uh, our only strong point that we have is we still have nature, we've got wildlife, we've got all these magnificent areas to visit. So tourism really for the future, this is us. This is who we need to be and this is where we should concentrate our efforts. But that's my opinion. I hope you, some of you agree with me. Otherwise, I make peace with it. Hope to see you again next week and until then, keep well. <laughs>